welcome to Carolina Poets. We are so excited to be here with you today because we have such an exciting show. Um, thank you to everyone who's been tuning in every Thursday night. But if this is the first time that you've tuned in, um, this event is called Hashtag Poetry Goes Viral. Um, we started this back in March in response to the pandemic when um, so many authors' book tours were being canceled and we wanted to find a way to get poets back out to their audiences with a focus on the Carolinas. My name is Kimberly Sims and I am your host tonight and one of the founders of Poetry Goes Viral. Um, I curate this and host along with my compatriots Andrew K. Clark and Derek Berry and we all take turns um, hosting and booking the poets and it really has been such a joy. I'm very excited about tonight's show. We have Richard Garcia, we have Dorian Locks, and we have Joseph Millar for you tonight, which we are just thrilled about. Um, next week, we are having another special show, which is going to be an open mic. So if you are interested um, in sharing two poems um, with our audiences, please definitely message us. Um, at the Carolina Poets page. Uh, my name is Kimberly Sims Gibbs on Facebook. You can message me. Um, and we're basically going to give the opportunity for anyone who wants to, to basically jump on the stream and share some poems, which I think will be very appropriate um, next Thursday. Uh, we are here every Thursday night. Um, some of you may be watching the broadcast on our Facebook page, Carolina Poets, and some of you may be on our YouTube page. Um, I would love for you later on, if you can, to head over to our YouTube channel to like it. We're trying to get up to 100 subscribers so we can get our custom URL. Um, so if you have time to do that. And also, um, if you do not get to see all of tonight's reading, you can um, watch the recorded video, which will be available both on this Facebook page and our YouTube channel um, as soon as this broadcast has finished. Um, I'm kind of chatting away here because we did want to give everyone a chance to jump online. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. The order tonight is going to be Richard Garcia. Then we're going to have uh, Dorian Locks and Joseph Millar. Um, so without any further ado, I am going to um, introduce Richard, um, who is originally from San Francisco, but now lives in Charleston, South Carolina. He started reading uh, writing poetry when he was a teenager and actually has some really great stories about um, reading and being around some of the beatnik poets when he was younger. Um, just had really just such a great perspective on poetry. Um, he won the 2016 Press 53 Award for Poetry for Porridge. He is the author of six books of poetry and his poems have appeared in many journals such as the Georgia Review, Crazy Horse, the Cortland Review, and plowshares. His work is also included in many anthologies, among them the Best of the Prose Poem, the Pushcart Prize, Best of Small Presses, and the Best American Poetry 2005. He is the recipient of a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, a Pushcart Prize, the Mudfish Prize from Mudfish Magazine, the Greensboro Award from the Greensboro Review, the Cohen Award for Plowshare, and the Georgetown Prize from the Georgetown Review. He was a poet in residence at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles for 12 years, where he conducted workshops in art and poetry for hospitalized children. He lives in Charleston with his wife, the poet Catherine Williams, and their dog, Max. This poem was written right after the 2016 election. Actually, it was written about a year and a half before that, but it was published. Uh, uh, right after the election, and it's called Canada, it's spelled with a K in this, you'll see why, uh, it's uh, Canada with a K is German, Canada, the dying Alaskan anarchists pleads to be buried in Canada, escaped slaves follow the drinking gourd toward Canada, Blacks who fought for the British escaped to Canada. Tories pack their wigs and head for Canada. Convicts on the lamb from chain gangs limp into Canada. Statues of the founding fathers thumb rides to Canada. 
Young men are fleeing the draft tiptoe into Canada. Penniless drifters drift across the border into Canada. Strange freight, Henry hidden in a box, special delivery to Canada, fragile, handled with care, use no hooks, Canada. Chief Joseph's men in running battle toward Canada they will fight no more forever, almost Canada. Not knowing Spanish, defeated Confederates flee to Canada. Bank robbers and bankers with their loot slip into Canada. Confounding Texas ranges, Gregorio Cortez turns north. Oh, Canada, this little brown mare trot, trot, trotting all day. Hi, Canada. After seeing the elephant, 49ers contemplate Canada. John Brown cries war and Frederick Douglass excuses himself to Canada. Warehouses of Jewish possessions at Auschwitz are called Canada. Piles of shoes, silverware, wedding rings, suitcases, gloves, Canada. Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, Dorothy Lamour on the road to Canada, returning formations of Canada gates tip their wings over Canada. Low on gas, buses full of seniors clutching prescriptions roll into Canada, watching the election returns, tenured professors consider Canada. After a little bighorn, Crazy Horse leads his people to Canada. Washington crossing the Delaware roads for Canada. General Custer asleep under the stars on his last night, dreams of Canada. Columbus asleep with his head on the tiller, dreams of Canada. The poem was written around the same time, which was after the uh, 2016 election, when they came out at that time. The sublime. Now, when they remember it, they think that perhaps they had heard the approach of the sublime. Like a distant hum of huge machinery long before it arrived. As it drew closer, there was no mistake in it as swaths of trees in the forest across the valley lay down in supplication. Some of the survivors describe it as an approaching shadow. Some say it became midnight in the afternoon and they saw constellations they had never seen before or since. Others say it was a conflagration. The air was on fire, houses and trees exploding before the flames even touched them. Some say the sublime was ice, or even just a deep silence. The only thing survivors agree on is that they could not take their eyes off of it. If there had been music, and some say there was, it would have been the ride of the Valkyries. And they stood there, their weapons like toys dangling from their hands, staring up at the advancing sublime. Shit, they said, and fuck, and God, they said, my God. This is a poem, a classical theme. On, uh, it's based on uh, Icarus. <clears throat> it's called Icky. Icky, they call him now. He got spiked hair, a couple of scars where he used to have wings. He's zipping a pina colada by the pool. He says to me, Pluto, who are you driving for Uber now? Give folks a tour all around the underworld. That place is just a damn sewer. Why don't you get yourself a striped shirt and straw hat so you can sing Oh Solo Meal while you're pulling around a bunch of dead people that don't tip shit? Me, I like it here. Got the pool, five villas around the world, my own show on Netflix, have more followers on Facebook and Twitter than that asshole in the White House. Plato says, 
Say, how is your dad? Didless or whatever his name was back then. He's still stuck on that island. Here he's got his own cell block now. Now, nah, says Icky, he owns the island. Rents it out to black ops and CIA types doing a little rendition on folks that nobody gonna miss anyway. Far as I'm concerned, he can rendition, rendition himself, sending me off into the sky with those Walmart wings. Honey, he says, Icky, to the babe wearing nothing but a thin gold chain around her hips, snapping his fingers. Get me another drink, will ya? And one for my buddy here. Say, Pluto, you still go by that handle? I got a little job for you. But really, you could use a new name. Pluto sounds like a dog or someone that used to be a planet or someone used to be big, used to be someone. This is called This is called California. The conquistadors are disembarking on the shores of what they think is an island. It is a paradise of tall waving grasses, of animals, bear, antelope, elk, and rivers so full of fish their horses are afraid to cross them. To pass the time while they are camping, the conquistadors are reading a book. The Adventures of Esplanandian, about an island, paradise, called California, an island inhabited by Amazons and ruled by their queen, Califia. Jaime Garcia, one of the conquistadors and an ancestor of mine, is reading the book while sitting on a log. He looks up at the great beauty of the land. Let's call this island California, he says after the mythical island California and their queen, the beautiful, wise, fierce Calafia. In the book, Calafia and all the Amazons are black. They are tall and muscular with long legs, small waists, and shapely breasts. To this day, you can see the queen, Calafia, represented brandishing her spear on the great seal of California. This Calafia is a white Amazon. She is seated on her throne, and at her feet is her pet grizzly cub. Arched over her is a Latin motto of California, which, in point of fact, was suggested by my ancestor, Jaime Garcia. Futurum es norum feminina. And that Latin motto, which I made up, is um, It says the future is black and feminine. Staying home so much during this this COVID time, uh, I kind of lose track. Well, track of time. Don't even know what day it is. Um, this poem is called <clears throat> Not Sunday. I woke up this morning and it's yesterday. I'm so glad. I thought it was tomorrow and I had forgotten something important I was going to do today. It is early in the morning and there is plenty of time to remember what the important thing I was going to do today is. I am holding down the fort taking care of the house and the dog. I can see the future. My wife will return from her travels, put down her suitcases in the hall and ask me, why are you still here? It is quiet in the house with just myself to talk to, but I avoid myself like the virus that has attacked the world. The virus is a round spiky ball that is 100 feet high and it rolls, crushing everyone, little screaming people, cars, buildings, in its path. Flinging their lab coats 
on the floor, the Japanese scientists have fled. The American president hunkers down in his secret bunker. Godzilla sequestered in his cave deep in the ocean rolls over in his sleep. This is called Dispatch from the Bower Bird. Yesterday evening, I was lying on the couch, studying all the bottles on the window shelf and the way the light shimmered in them when the wind shook the trees and how they sparkled all lit up. Then I decided to do something with my life and sat up and bent over to tie my shoes. I noticed that my shoelaces were all lit up in a sparkly blue and then my shoes and the rug beneath my shoes. I shook my head as if I had blue in my ears. I noticed all the overlapping reflections of the glass, windows, and doors. And through one reflection, I could see the evening star, the planet Venus, looking very close to me. So I went out on the porch to look at it. And Venus was shining with the same blue light. And it was too big to be a planet in the evening sky. So I shook my head again and went inside and sat on the couch. When you return, you will see how many wonderful things I have found for you. And all of them are blue. Fake Nazis. The jazz singer made in 1927 was the first talking movie. It starred Al Jolson. Al Jolson was his fake name. Al Jolson's real name was Jackie Rabinowitz. But as Al Jolson, he played a cantor who sings jazz with Paul Whiteman's jazz band. The band does not play real jazz but music copied from Cab Calloway's band playing the Cotton Club in Harlem. The musicians at the Cotton Club were black. Aside from the musicians and the workers, black people were not allowed at the Cotton Club. Fade to black, fade in. Six Nazi spies from Germany dropped off by some rain are hauling their lifeboat up on the beach. Their mission is to spread out to different East Coast cities and blow things up. But they're not really Nazi spies. Their hearts are not in it. They have a goal they did not tell their superior officers. They love jazz, real jazz, and they want to go to the Cotton Club. Tomorrow morning after a great night on the town, they plan to turn themselves into the FBI. Even if they have hangovers, they do not know that J. Edgar Hoover, a fake white man who is really a black man, does not like jazz. He hates the Cotton Club. Things will not go well for the fake Nazis. Written on the 4th of July. On this day, I say happy birthday, Mom. She died a long time ago, but she was always dying. She'd say, good morning, Mom. How are you? I'm dying, she would say. What's for dinner, you'd ask? I'm dying, she would answer. She died so much that when she did die, we hardly noticed. Of course, she had a long life since she was born a long time ago. She was the cleaning lady at the Continental Congress in Philly in 1776. She did such a good job cleaning up all the dirt and dust and ashes and spittoons and bathrooms. The founding fathers 
gave all their slaves that were working the concessions and getting the carriages and grooming the horses and cleaning up their freedom. My mother was from Mexico and much cheaper than the slaves. And all they had to do was feed her pancakes, which she thought were Yankee tortillas. The farming fathers were so happy with my mother's work that they named Independence Day for her birthday, the 4th of July. The slaves that had been freed that day were really spies for the English. They were happy too and went back to England and became butlers and grooms and were paid for their work. Not a lot, but the English had good pancakes and lodging and the workers had insurance and a retirement plan. It's called fresh trout and rhubarb pie. My sister-in-law wrote me a letter. Nobody in the family had ever written me a letter. I wondered how she even got my address. To be fair, I had never written anyone in my family a letter either. But I did know my parents' address. My sister-in-law was chosen to write me a letter because she spoke English and she could write a short letter. The letter said, Dear brother-in-law, your father died three months ago, but we forgot to tell you. So I am telling you now, your father died three months ago. This made me angry at my father. I had been hanging out with him for three months and he never bothered to tell me he was dead. I turned to him where we stood in the river, casting our fly rods. Why didn't you tell me you were dead? I forgot, he said. I should have noticed. I mean, since when did he speak English? Since when did he go fishing? He was angry too. Why didn't you tell me I was dead? Did you even notice I was dead? How about you, I said. Did you even notice that you were dead? No, he admitted. What the fuck? We just kept fishing. We caught six rainbow trout and brought them home, picking some wild rhubarb on the way. Fresh trout fried in bacon fat and rhubarb pie. We had the best day ever. This is a poem from uh, a book of poems from the mind, Porridge. <clears throat> Regret. God was depressed. Satan was depressed. These had their regrets. These people they had made were disappointing. They all wanted to be animals. They ate, grew, nested, copulated, reproduced animals. So God and Satan summoned Lilith. Eve's older sister. She came in a black Cadillac convertible driven by an enormous serpent accompanied by angels. One angel wore a black leather jacket. One picked his teeth with a switchblade. Another angel dressed in a zoot suit made of small mirrors seemed preoccupied with his fingernails. Lilith wore her little black dress. Now we're Getting somewhere, said God. Satan nodded. Yeah, baby. So this is the uh, last one I'll read. It's called Ladders. First, the people had to invent ladders. No one had ever seen a ladder. Once they had ladders, they invented walls to climb over. Soon they realized it was, took two ladders to climb a wall, one to climb up one side, one to climb down the other. People would ascend one side of the wall, descend the other side of the wall, and then walk away, leaving the ladders behind. That is why there are so many ladders in the world. 
The letters are picked up and stored in an enormous warehouse. Scientists have proposed attaching all the letters, one on top of the other, creating an elevator into outer space. Some people want to destroy all the ladders. Some people want to destroy all the walls. Some people say that someday we're going to need all the ladders in the world. Great. Thank you, Richard. Um, as many of you know, we did have a hurricane that um, came through the Carolinas today via New Orleans. So our uh, we have a lot of power outages um, out across the state, and so our internet is not what it normally is here in the Carolinas. Um, but we are so grateful to have all of our readers with us here tonight, and I'm very excited to bring up our next reader, which is Dorian Locks, um, who normally is in Raleigh, North Carolina, but is back um, in California due to the pandemic. Um, but she does teach. Um, both on uh, in Raleigh and also in California. They have such an exciting life. And what, uh, the, by coastal, is that a word? I felt like it should be. Um, but Dorian Locke's sixth collection, Only As a Day Is Long, New and Selected Poems, was named a finalist for the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. Um, and if you do not have a copy of that book, please, we're going to put some links um, in the chat today so that you can go and pick that up because if you don't have it, you need that in your life. You absolutely do. Um, the Book of Men was awarded the Patterson Prize. Her fourth book of poems, Facts About the Moon, won the Oregon Book Award and was shortlisted for the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize. Lau was also the author of Awake, What We Carry, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, and Smoke as well as a fine small press edition, The Book of Women. She's a co-author of the celebrated text, The Poet's Companion, A Guide to the Pleasures of Writing Poetry. And actually, I was watching, um, she recently did an interview with um, Tim from Rattle, and he was saying that he had not really even been into poetry until he studied a book of poetry by Dorian Locke when he was in college, and that is what basically got him into loving poetry, which I think is pretty high praise so um dorian we are just thrilled to have you here today and um i'm going to step backstage and give you give thank you it all you. <laughs> thank you hello everyone hello therese and all the emmett roney and you know wonderful people from pacific mfa which is where we also teach um and uh, I thought today that um, I would read new poems um, rather than poems from the book. That shouldn't preclude you buying the book. You know, I don't want to stop anybody from buying the book. Um, but it was so wonderful to hear Richard. And um, he came to visit us. I don't know if you can see it. I, I tried to put it up on the, um, the share. but. Um, he came to visit us in 2017 and uh, in North Carolina at State and gave a wonderful reading. Our students just fell in love with him. We fell in love with him when we had seen him a couple years earlier at, I think it was Beyond Baroque, where we read together with him and, uh, and met his lovely wife, uh, who I guess is going to be reading here soon as well. And you should definitely um, give her a listen. Um, she's a surfer, you know, they both used to live in California. So she surfed the wild ride in California and I'm sure she, I know she does it there in North Carolina as well, but not during a hurricane. Um, so anyhow, welcome everyone. And I'm just going to read a few poems and then get out of here. So my wonderful husband can read you some more. Um, and these are all new poems that we've been creating with a couple of groups that we meet with online. Um, and uh, one of those groups meets Sunday and one meets Monday. And when we meet, we, we bring a couple of words and maybe a phrase or uh, a time of year or color. And then we all have to write poems using all of those words and phrases and ideas. And uh, we come up with some pretty interesting stuff. One of the groups I'm in um, 
Matthew Dickman is also in. And Matthew began our meeting one day by talking about how uh, Oregon has the smallest park in America. And I didn't know that. And uh, he said it was also named after a poet. And so this poem came out of that comment. The smallest park in America is dedicated to a poet. Maybe five people can stand up in it, which is enough warm bodies for most poetry readings. Most poetry readings are given at dusk, the darkest part of twilight, a poetic word if there ever was one. The time right before Orion rises in the east, a time when all five poets look up and sing their verses to his belt. There is always a vase of just cut flowers, dying in a narrow vase set upon a skinny, wobbly lectern, a squat glass of water some poets replace with vodka, maybe a splash of bitters. The poet's poems are peeled in layers like onion skins, and someone always cries mineral tears that fall onto patches of grass from which a staircase grows, winding in a spiral into the crowns of trees, dislodging hazelnuts. Everyone then cracks with their poet-loving teeth, grinding down the mealy meat. After many long distances and a boatload of words later, the poetry reading ends, first to silence, then to quiet applause, at which point someone bends down and unlatches the shin-high gate and they parade out the door made of any weather and into the dark hallways of evening to search for their cars. They stand for a moment under the stars, remembering what it was like to be held gently in a lion's open mouth. So that's the poetry reading. Um, and this one I'm reading kind of in honor of Richard's poem, uh, where he talks about God. And this is called God's Sorrow. And it has a little um, epigraph from Matthew uh, in the Bible, 10, 29, 31. Not a single sparrow falls to the ground without father's knowledge. That tiny brown bird with white splashes on both cheeks is leaving us. Their feathered cadavers found in fields or shrugged from branches and wind. Their voices morning prayers sung from the eaves of barns and houses. Waves of them, a knot or flutter, host or quarrel, a crew of sparrows rowing the air. God must be bereft, wearing his sweater of sadness, sitting in his truck, morning's engine revving his first cup of coffee going cold in his hands, his woman still asleep beneath the covers in the house behind him, his breath fogging the truck windows. He never asked for this sacrifice, their weightless bodies falling like the snow that just won't stop. He watches the light return above the hills, climbing the ridge like a soft animal, timid, at first, then recklessly setting the trees on fire. He knows the great flood is coming. His blue umbrella collapsed on the seat beside him. He remembers the first one he held in his tender palms, still as the world on the first morning. How hard it was to place such perfect wings into a shallow grave. Now all he sees a row upon row of stones, under each a sparrow, and he cannot fathom it, cannot even lift his foot and press the weight of it to the bald pedal, that after so many mornings, his boot tread has finally worn away. Um, <clears throat> and this is a, a poem. Uh, that came out of a comment someone made today. I just wrote this very quickly today in response to a poet um, <coughs> who, who said, you know, gave an exercise online. And the exercise was to use the phrase, poetry is petty. And, um, and then Mark Doty made a little video. He wanted us to make videos and 
you know, respond to that. And Mark Doty made a wonderful video where he said, no, I just can't go with poetry as petty. Just can't do it. You know, and he, he, beautiful explanation, spontaneous, as Mark Doty is, you know, brilliant. And so I did a quick response. And mine is um, untitled as yet. Poetry is never petty, nor is it pretty, though beautiful in highly particular ways. A particulate vision, a portal through which you might see a postal worker walking through the rain, his satchel bulging with America's faces, making a path through thunder, bolts of sky parting to light the way. Poetry is pagan and perilous and powerful as a boy in a pond, naked as day, deep as night, potent as an elixir, peaceful and pure as any driven snow. A Shakespearean phrase, or a pregnant woman prowling the kitchen, hunting for a plum, or a pitcher of pamplemousse under a paper moon. Poetry is a parade, a partner in crime, a passage to passion, a patch of blue, a pungent perfume. It is persistent, patient, a pause in time, persuasive as wine, a grand piano of pity and terror, a poisoned arrow, a plea, a pardon, a praise, a high priest, a prescription for the soul, rock and roll, a pearl of great price, my one beloved vice. So somebody said they lost the signal, but it looks like somebody just wrote persuasive as wine. So maybe they just lost the signal, but hopefully I'm still here. And uh, this is another short poem, newer one. Um, let's see. Uh, well, actually, I'm, I'm reading these off of my computer, and I might have lost it. No, here it is. It's called Our Job. Sometimes we forget it's our job to be happy. We get old and forget our glasses, our keys. Certain words float away like windswept balloons. How the wind can make a field of clover, a deep green ocean, lapping over our bare toes. The moon a Roman coin purse fallen open, spilling its history and light for free. We forget to be stupid with happiness, like an empty railroad car filling with evening, rumbling over the yellow hills. We forget to say goodbye with a sloppy kiss, like dogs say hello in their dog language, to have sex like two kerosene lamps, our tongues lit wicks to give each other hickeys on the neck before leaving. Um, and this one, I also just wrote the other night, I've become addicted to uh, ancient aliens. And uh, so this is what I watch before I go to sleep at night. So this right now for lack of a better, better title is called Bedtime Stories. I like falling asleep to ancient aliens, watching those flickering X-file lights tessellating through the forest, the glowing discs, triangles, the glowing discs, triangles and long metal lozenges, the three basic shapes of UFOs caught on cameras and wobbly videos. I love the secret of the pyramids how the man in a lab coat, scientist of renown, asks, how the heck did they do it? What kind of celestial saw did they use? How did they transport them from one island to another? What kind of angels are carved into the chapels of massive stone? I like listening to the hum of space gears and distant stars, like tinnitus in a tin cup, the sand turned to glass where the ship touched down on their rotating bands of turquoise lights. I love the childlike drawings of those who've been abducted, their ovoid heads on spider-like bodies, their eyes translucent capsules of vitamin B12, mouthless, earless, sexless creatures tasked 
with human examination, prodding and pulsing above the darkly vaginal ones, flowering penises that must confound them as much as they confound us, bathed in a shower of curiosity and confusion beneath the incandescent dome. Episode after episode, they arrive and depart, each show more impossible and vaguely probable than the last, until the night finally takes me into the sweet release of sleep and I doze off in the TV's cathode beam its glimmer and glint, its gleam and flare, as I fall up into space, made of nothing but light and time, formless and flailing, an alien to my waking life. So, get hooked on ancient aliens, it's the best. Um, and uh, this is a poem from my mother. Um, I wrote uh, many poems about her throughout my life and her life. And, um, and I have a good number of them as the new poems in uh, the new and selected um, that I just uh, published. But, you know, the poems keep coming. I mean, she's always been my muse and she'll continue to be my muse. And this one is uh, for her and also for the Singer sewing machine that we had in our house. It's called Singer. If I could go back to the living room window of my childhood house, look again through the pane, it would be a telescope lens through which I might see the first woman I ever met, my mother at her sewing machine, rewinding the bobbin, little spool with holes like an old movie reel our tiny lives spun inside of. I might see her long piano fingers touch the balance wheel, the throat plate, the presser bar, one bare foot working the treadle, her heel revealing only the first three letters in black latticed metal, sin. My mother was what some called a sinful woman, divorced, pregnant without a husband, a baby boy given up for adoption, remarried, another baby born of another man, a one night stand while her husband was away at war. She drank too much, thought too much, laughed with her head thrown back, danced with anyone. Too pretty, too brainy, too tall, her black hair a snare that hooked men in. But right now she's fully visible, stretching the fabric for a kitchen curtain a child's dress, swatches she salvaged from the deep sail bins, using the selvage for a hem, thereby cutting her handiwork by half, the black oiled mechanism banging down dress after dress, tablecloths and runners, nothing she couldn't cobble together from the waist of others. She was a very particular, peculiar mother, and by now you can see why we loved her. She was a lit fuse in the rain. She turned from her work and set those same fingers on the piano keys and pulled music through the air. Making something from nothing was what she was good at. Love, children, shorts and t-shirts to dress them in. A table covered with cherries on which the beautiful food appeared roses from a front yard garden in an old cracked vase, her long arms around our shoulders saying, sit still, eat, try not to spill anything. And uh, I, thought, I thought I'd end with um, uh, this poem called Late October, since it is late October and we're all quite, um, um, I don't know, going maybe a little bit crazy right now. And so this poem is from an old book, What We Carry. Uh, and it's included, I think, in, in uh, Only As the Day Is Long. And, uh, and it, it's, um, it's a poem I think that we can all relate to right now. Very witchy. Late October. Midnight. The cats under the open window. They're guttural 
territorial yowls. Crouched in the neighbor's driveway with a broom, I jab at them with a bristle end, chasing their raised tails as they scramble from bush to bush, intent on killing each other. I shout and kick until they finally give it up. One shimmies beneath the fence, the other under a car. I stand in my underwear in the trembling quiet, remembering my dream. Something had been stolen from me, valueless and irreplaceable. Grease and grass blades were stuck to the bottoms of my feet. I was shaking and sweating. I had wanted to kill them. The moon was a white dinner plate, broken exactly in half. I saw myself as I was, 41 years old, standing on a slab of cold concrete, a broom handle slipping from my hands, my breasts bare, my hair on end, afraid of what I might do next. That was amazing. Wow, what a treat we Thank had you. tonight. After listening to Richard and now you, I just want to go write poems. <laughs> Good. Good. That's, you know, that's what you said as a poet. That was amazing. Thank you so much. That's all we ask. <laughs> poems, you know? Okay. Well, we're going to Thank say goodbye you. for a minute and we are going to bring on here in just a second your dear husband, Joe. But thank you so much. We'll see you back in a second. Um, this whole night with Richard and, and Dorian so far and now Joe has really been just such a treat. And last night I was watching some videos of um, Joe Millar at the Dodge Poetry Festival and his poetry is just such a wonderful combination of wit and humor and um, and then deepness and just so many wonderful things that um, I'm just so excited um, to bring up yet another amazing poet tonight. Um, Joseph Millar is the author of several poetry collections, including Blue Rust 2011, 1420, 2007, Overtime 2001. And he actually has a new book, um, Dark Harvest, and God, that title, um, Dark Harvest coming out from the um, Carnegie Mellon, Mellon Press. So definitely, uh, we're going to be posting his link. So you can also pick up that book, um, take it home, and Feed Your Poetry Soul. Um, it's really exciting to have so many new books coming out this year. Um, his book, Overtime, which was released in 2001, was a finalist for the Oregon Book Award. He's received grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Montevallo Arts Center, the Oregon Larry Arts. His poetry has been featured on Garrison Keillor's National Public Radio Program. That sounds like a dream for a poet right there. The Writer's Almanac and won a Pushcart Prize. Millar, who has taught at Pacific University, the University of Oregon, and the Oregon State University, lives in Raleigh, North Carolina, with his wife, poet um, Dorian Locks. Um, so this is just going to be another treat. Joe, thank you so much. It's such a treat to have you here. Um, I'm going to jump off stage. Are you? Are you? Are you doing okay? Yep. Good. Awesome. Well, great. Well, I'm going to leave you to it, and then we'll jump back on here a little bit. Okay. Okay. So. <clears throat> um, those are two fine poets that we just heard, and um, and and I, I I I don't usually have to follow my wife, and I I'm glad I don't usually have to because you know you could see she's a killer, but uh, and we've been writing this summer, and and for some time I've been I've gotten into this thing where I'm doing more rhyming and less. Nar and less narrative and so I don't always know what I'm doing but uh, I, I decided to stop griping about it and just write them down and then <laughs> I was told by my wife stop griping and write them down uh, so she she ended with an autumn poem and this is kind of an aut autumn autumnal poem and it's um, called River Road. It was raining 
when we got back up river, a soft rain that fused the gray sky and the water and sounded its whisper among the trees. For the season was coming down to an end and whatever was left undone would now be set free and left behind. And I started packing a suitcase. I put in some jam and a camera with a telephoto lens. I put in some wire and construction staples and an old violin. I knew there was no need to salvage the glass, though my heart stretched out with its stents and new piping, for the wine was gone and no turning back to cover the feelings of growing old. And the October nights would keep getting longer, playing their etudes and harmonies, their big stars that shine on down from the past and threaten to drink up the road. Okay. Uh, this one is called Boots and Coat. I wanted to give my boots and coat as though I were his mom to the man sitting outside the post office on the narrow bench alone, having a conversation with the air. It looked like his forehead was made of stone and I wish I had taken the time to speak but I was afraid of his eyes and hair, his trembling knuckles and cauliflower ear. How do humans even talk to each other? How do they know what to say? Watching the smoky sky and weather, though tonight the stars have all drifted west over the great saltwater depth and the small quick hands of the raccoon are sifting the broken mussel shells under the alkali moon. You know it's easy to walk away in your shoes for work, in your boots for the river, and you know it takes more than a kiss on the eyelids to stop the tears of a grieving mother. <laughs> these are the new poems are the first time I've read these new poems. I mean, except to the people in our group. So sometimes you hear the similar language, you know, like telephoto lens and whatever. I noticed that was in Annie's last book. We got the same words going on because we use the same words. Uh, this one is called uh, Materials. George Oppen, the great George Oppen, he had a book called Materials, and he was hella smart, way, way smarter than I am. So it, it was different. He used them in a different sense than I do, which is just, I just use them like more or less material in the world that I can name and sometimes make a poem out of. Materials. There's pieces of silver and pieces of rock Wood blades spinning in the ceiling fan. The temperature's high, maybe over 100, where you sleep in the electric TV light with the clicker under your hand. And when I was a boy, I slept in the attic next to my pagan drum. Though sometimes I felt like an alien there, rhythmic and speechless, half ashamed. And I dreamed of a woman with wine-colored hair swirled back like a tangled mane. Today I know there's no God but God watching the big woman next door bending down in her purple robe and putting out food for the cats. For she must have been in love before standing outside in the shadows alone, listening to gulls cry out in the wind, which goes wherever it wants to go and may not return again.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just reading these new ones. Um, uh, this one is called uh, Materials 2. Crack, sack, smack, shellac. You listen to the sounds of Babylon, to the rattle and slam of the midnight train, and other noises you can't tell apart, carnival joy or evangelical pain coming straight from the heart. And you are not sad about the jade ring lost in the frozen sand. You are like the mouse who hides in the wall. He's chewing the plaster, making a hole. His feet spread open like hands. For he can smell something sweet near the sink, honey, or blackberry jam. <laughs> That's kind of like me. I have a couple more of these new of these new ones and and then we'll call it good. I hope your internet didn't cut out. Oh, you can't hear me out there? Uh -uh. You're oh. frozen on the screen. Yeah, you came back on. Joe just came back on, I think. How how many poems did they make? Okay. No, nothing. It just went out for a second. I think you're good. We just lost you for like just Jeez. like ten seconds after your last poem. Well, yeah. okay. You're good. Right. Back off. Oh, no. Please. I'm going to add you back, back on. There you go. Let me. I can't. Am I back on? What, what did she say? She's going to yes, go. Yes, you're back on. So I'm going to add you on, and your internet working great. You just popped out for a second. Okay. Should I go now and keep reading? Yeah, yeah go ahead and keep reading. It's amazing. I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I guess I, caught, I went out for a minute there. I've been known to do that. Okay, this is, this is a sort of love poem. Anyway, it's one, another, one, another new one. It's called Sometimes. Sometimes you'd give anything to disappear into the twilight again. Listening. Am I good? I guess I'm good. Listening to the forest's insomniac shuffling, the ravens loosening the pines, where the blue mud squishes under your soles, in your left hand a jar of cheap wine, which is clouded up like a blurry lens, the dust of the air from five counties east, which comes drifting through the August night, smelling of burning grass, and these lines were not written above Tintern Abbey, nor from the NASA space station with its silicate windows and oxygen. The galaxies clustered along some filament like a river that has no end. Though your hair is a world full of time and despair, which can't be compared to any other its dark red thickness is streaked with gray, me with my perfume, and you with your feathers, for we were always obsessive lovers. Uh, and I'll end with this one, which is called uh, Migrations. I watch the horses, how the light returns and the fog lifts over the fields and the tan sparrows flutter in the gold stalks of pampas grass and the dust flares in its plumes. I think of the austere wooden floor where the Zen students sit under the mind's umbrella, the waves of thought rolling over the sand coming close to the dunes and Brando hollering upstairs to Stella, the reckless nasal voice of desire, fearsome and manic, trapped in the spell 
of the body's magnetic fire. Sometimes I dream of a quiet woman drifting down river, looking up at the shore. I think of my youth with its cup of sadness. I learned to sacrifice and ignore, to arrive with the bees and the orange moths jittering here in the lantana bush, along with the southbound butterflies, only two steps from my door. Thank you. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, what a treat. And that, it's been so fun um, hearing everybody together, but also hearing all this new work that you guys have been producing. I'm going to bring everybody, I'm going to bring um, Dorian and Richard back on for just a second. And first of all, I just like to say thank you, Richard and Dorian and Joe, for giving up your time to us tonight because it has just been such a treat. I just want to lock all the trigger treaters out and write poems all weekend. <laughs> How has it been, do you think, as poets during the pandemic? You feel like you've written more or I found that my metaphors and fantasies dreams and so on have mm -hmm. become yeah. yeah. And I mean, really, yeah. so I have a lot of hallucinations. Right. I've always seen people more, but people more often. I hear great people. And that's one of the poems that I got. It sounds really fantastic for everything to do with that. Really, I think it's a lot of wiring. So, yeah, this isolation has that. The only thing, too, I just think it's. it's this is the key. In this time, you're forced to go inside me. Yeah. You're forced to write harder and you think harder and you think harder. Absolutely. I think you can afford to think of the music. So, and we're in the guys. Pardon? What about y'all? How is the pandemic? Do you think you've been writing more or has it changed? Yeah. I think um, I love what Richard says about write harder and hate harder. And, you know, um, I think it forced us all into a certain kind of isolation, which is the whole burden. You mm -hmm. know, and that's where we live. And uh, so, in some ways, no, it's not hard because you know. But on the other hand, it's difficult because the mind is so rude with what's going on right now and how terrible it all is and in so many ways, you know, I mean, the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, um, right. you know, what Betsy DeVos is doing to the school system. I mean, you can just go on and on. And, um, and we feel, I think, even more helpless now because we're all so shuttered away. So I think it's difficult for people to write. And what we found is that being with a group of people and getting together a couple of, you know, uh, once a week with, with these groups makes us, one, responsible. Right. People and those poets and responsible to poetry and right. um, allows us to do something I think that on our own might be more difficult to do. Mm. So, you know, Hillary Clinton said it takes a village. And... Uh, <laughs> And you y'all meet over Zoom? Are y'all meeting via Zoom or something like that? Yeah, yeah. That's great. That's great. Now, um, I also wanted to talk about because you guys all have it's so interesting that Richard and Joe and you, Dorian, you all have this ca this California Carolina kind of connection, um, and I think that's so interesting to have that like because those are like such different cultures. Um, I don't have to tell you that. <laughs> you know, this very different culture. And so I just wondered how um, you all felt like, did it change you as a poet if you started in California and came to Carolina? Or how has that, that difference, you know, affected you as a writer? But Joe, what, what do you think? We haven't you've been very quiet up there. Yeah, well, you know, I, I can't, 
I, I came to California. I mean, unlike Richard and, and Dorian, who are native Californians, I, I came here um, at, in 1967 when I just out of school, and then stayed here mm. until until uh, I moved up to Oregon to be with Manny in the in the late 90s. And and I don't think I would have been able to start writing if I hadn't come out here. Mm. Where are you from originally? Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania, okay. battleground state. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I, and I don't know, I just was too, I was too, uh, California just has been like my, uh, and, and when we came to Carolina, um, I mean, people are people, you know, mm. so that's a, that's a thing for sure. And, and, Absolutely. and, but, but, uh, I, I like that food back there. <laughs> And, uh, what about you? Uh, the, you know, coming to Carolina. I mean, uh, well, yeah, Carolina has. Uh, I'm surprised we have great writers. Any of the southern writers are supposed to be good, right? Yeah. Who they are. And it's the same for the southern parts. I mean, they're doing great. And uh, although I had that friend from California and the group from all this, I have to tell you that. Well, in Carolina, they're a lot better than they think they are. And in California, they're not as good as they <laughs> think. <laughs> but like, a lot of people I know in California are less sophisticated. It sounds funny. But like, I know a lot of them are not a good way. I also love black culture and, uh, and the food of that and uh, the Martians. And it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Dorian, what about you? Well, it it was really the the last big move uh, we mm -hmm. made, you know, in our lives, and uh, we really wanted to experience the South. Um, <laughs> we really had not experienced. You hear, you know, stories about it, and but we hadn't had any direct experience. And it is, after all, the seat of you know the nation. I mean, so much happened you know there it's got such a history and um you know if you if you had asked me when i was a young and growing up in school you know what the civil war was about you know i mean i i i kind of knew vaguely you know i knew there were grays and blues but i had no idea which was which i didn't you know yeah. History starts a little bit later in California. I think yeah. history starts like in the 1890s in California as opposed to... Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I, now if you had asked me as a child about the history of the Miwok Indians, I could tell you anything you wanted to know, you know. But, you know, the Carolinas, even just the East Coast in general, you know, I knew much less about. So it was a real education for both of us. And uh, and I find you know North Carolina coming into my poems now, and um, and yet I still write poems about California. It's the, it's Absolutely. not really the place of my birth. I was born in Maine. Oh wow! Um, okay. But I was brought out very very young by my mother mm -hmm. um, when I was two, you know two. So I don't really remember Maine, California, right. San Diego specifically. Right is where I always live. So right next to the border, you know, and not too far from LA. That's I mean, my strong landscape. I think, I think that, you know, California yeah. and Carolina just have really distinct, strong landscapes, which yeah. is landscape is such an important part of, I think being a writer. Um, but this has just been such a treat to have you all on here tonight. I don't want to um, keep everybody on too long. But um, we are going to be posting the links to everybody's books tonight. And um, if you're out there watching, you know, this has been um, a wonderful time for everyone to do some writing as a writer. But, you know, not getting to do our book tours like we normally do. Um, this is a book tour event. So I hope that you will go out and, um, and, and buy these books from these authors. Um, particularly if you can get them from their website, that's always a plus, um, I think. But um, thank you. 
Richard and Joe and Dorian for coming on tonight. We so appreciate it. I, I just want to mention Ariana Grammaticus. Yes. She said this was her first poetry reading she's ever attended. Yes. And that it was a wonderful experience. I mean, it makes all of us feel so good when we have That's a first time awesome. poetry reading. Yeah, well, I love our, it. And if you are following us tonight, please like um, our Facebook page, Carolina Poets. We have a YouTube channel that we're building. This reading is going to live on our Facebook page and also is going to be living on our YouTube channel. We're trying to get to 100 subscribers um, so that we can push out even more content. And please, if you are a burgeoning writer, join us next Thursday and read in our open mic. Um, just definitely um, comment or send us a message and we'll get you on the list. Um, thank you again, Joe, Rich, and Dorian. This has just been such a treat. I'm going to let y'all go because we just had so much of your time tonight. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and we look forward um, to seeing you all again soon. So I'm going to say good night and let y'all off the stage. Thank you so much. Um, and please, definitely, next week we're going to be having um, our open mic. And then we are here every single Thursday at 7 o'clock featuring three poets with Carolina Connections. Um, if you are a poet um, with a connection to the Carolinas with a new book coming out, then definitely send us a message. We'd love to get you on. Um, and once again, it's myself, Kimberly Sims, Andrew Clark, and Derek Berry curating this each week. Um, we will see you again hopefully next Sunday, and thank y'all for being a wonderful audience.